Today, the Lord's message is about the fruit that remains. The fruit that remains, and it's called the disciple builder. Disciple builder. Please join me in a word of prayer. Dear God in heaven, Lord, thank you once again, dear God, for this new day, Lord, this Sunday morning. We are able, Lord, to uh, worship you. And ask for the day, Lord, to worship. With your word, Lord God, allow us, Lord, to understand what you want us to learn. And the Holy Spirit, continue to be in our midst, Lord God. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you be the speaker this morning, Lord God. Use me, Lord God, as your vessel, oh Lord, to convey your message. And I humble myself before you, Lord God, so that you alone will be heard this morning. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to John 15, 16. This is the Lord Jesus who is talking here. John 15, 16, it says here, You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. The Lord Bless the reading of the scriptures. <clears throat> what is the church's mission? You still remember our mission statement? You remember that? Okay. Um, let's recite it all together. And if you don't remember it, get one of the bulletins. It's there. Open it in the second page. It's there. Here's our mission statement. It says here, We share the truth of, God, of the word of God. We show God's love for authentic relationship with one another. We serve the community. We worship with fellow believers. We share and give to the needy. The Lord help us. Right? Almost every Sunday you would hear me remind you of the Great Commission. Almost every Sunday I would preach about the Great Commission. But what is the Great Commission all about? The Great Commission came directly from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all about sharing the gospel message of Jesus. Gospel message of Christ. Baptizing all those who believe and what? Making disciples. But how do we do that? How do we make disciples? Is KCC geared in sharing the gospel? Have we been discipled? Have we been mentored so that we have the proper tools to make disciples so that we as a body are fulfilling the Great Commission? Are we as a body, or as individual members of the body, fulfilling the Great Commission? I remember when I was growing up too, I, I thought discipleship was all about attending, you know, this discipleship training seminars that were being, uh, you know, conducted in church. And, and, you know, the host church will always have it in the afternoon because there's only one service during church, during Sundays. And in the afternoon, there's discipleship training, always. And I thought, that's it. That's, that's how you, you become a disciple. You just attend there, you know, and, and, and learn from that. And, and that's separate from the Wednesday night, prayer night meeting, you know, and... and um, if there was a Friday night sale, you know, that's separate again. Uh, this discipleship is, an, I thought it was a rigid training about how to make disciples. But the thing is, I was taught how to make converts, not disciples. We were given goals on how many we are to lead to Christ for a certain period of time. So there's a goal, X number of uh, months we have y number of people to bring to christ to lead to christ and when you reach that goal you get self-satisfaction and that you thought you were a good disciple maker you know looking back now i would say that my friends and the people whom the lord saved through my relationship with them were hardly if at all disciple nor were nor have they grown or thrived or are now bearing fruit in a flourishing relationship with Christ. It's very sad. The question therefore is, does your fruit remain? Does your fruit remain? 
in our text we read earlier, that was our Lord Jesus again. He was the one, like I said earlier, He was the one speaking, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I have appointed you to have a lasting fruit. Jesus wants our fruit to last. Look at how it was written, singular. He doesn't mind if you only had one fruit. Singular. But his purpose is that our fruit shall remain. He doesn't want to lose our fruit. That was the Lord's concern that our fruit shall remain. It was also the apostles, the apostle Paul's central concern in his ministries. Apostle Paul, he was the apostle to the Gentiles, to us. And that was his concern. He wants that a fruit shall remain. He wants that. He doesn't want that his labor should be in vain. You know, to the Corinthian church, he warned them, he warned them not to believe in vain and not to receive the grace of God in vain. If you open up 1 Corinthians 15, 2, it says there, It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. Again, in 2 Corinthians 6, 6, 1, he said, As God's partners, we beg you not to accept the marvelous gifts of, Christ, of God's kindness and then ignore it. You know, the fruit should remain, shall remain. To the church in Galatia, Paul was very much concerned that all his labor over the brethren was wasted because the church were all but sitting on the fence. You know, it's a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, can't stand on which ground they want to stand on. He said, Galatians 4.11, I fear for you. Perhaps my hard work with you was for nothing. To the church in Philippi, he pleaded with them to work out their salvation with fear and trembling so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or have labored in vain. He said in Philippians 2.16 Hold firmly to the word of life then on the day of Christ return I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless and to the Thessalonians he warned the church the church was facing persecution out of fear that their labor would be in vain that's why he said in Thessalonians 3 5 that is why when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith is still strong. I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you and that our work had been useless. Had been vain. But you would say, wait a second, Cosme. You know, I thought I always hear from you that our business is to just, you know, plant the seed broadcast the seed and that's it it's the Lord's work, it's God's work to make the seed grow and bear fruit right it's God's business to water and make the seed grow I thought I always hear that from you listen, we're talking about two different topics here evangelism and discipleship let me say that again evangelism and say it with me, discipleship, disciple making. Evangelism is your right, planting the seed, broadcasting the message of the gospel of Christ, that's good. And it's God's business to make it grow, that's correct. But disciple making, or making disciples, is on our shoulders that, my sweet brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, is our business. Remember the Great Commission. What did God say? What did Jesus say? Make disciples. You know, preach the word, baptize them, and what? Make disciples. That's our 
concern that is our business. We make disciple, disciples. That is my business. That is your business. That is every believer's business. It is duplicating what your mentor, your spiritual father, or the person who birthed you into the spiritual kingdom, word of God. It's making sure that the person whom you are discipling is able to repeat what you did in his life. You have to be duplicable. And the person that you are mentoring has to duplicate you. That way, you are multiplied. multiplied. It's being an accountable person to your brother. It's pouring out your life and investing it to your brother. Imagine the investment that Paul had on them, on all of these people, on all the churches that he started. He risked his life for them. It was literally blood, sweat, and tears. He endured shipwrecks. He was beaten and left for dead. I use the word invest because that's exactly what you do when you disciple someone. You invest. You invest to that person. Your resources, precious time and money, your wisdom in the Word of God. It is investing your life to that person. You want to leverage yourself to someone so that he, again, like I said earlier, he is able to duplicate what you did or what you are doing. You remember the power of multiplication? I showed that to you before, right? That person does what you're doing and he multiplies the same way that you do and then the church will grow and make not only converts, say it with me, disciples. Make disciples. You want to duplicate yourself to that person that, so that there will come a time that when he is ready, he can be on his own. And he is able and fully equipped to do what you did for him and make disciples as well. It's very clear that Paul, Paul's concern was that all the effort and labor that he has spent with the believers was not found to be by God to be useless. He wants the fruits that he bore in all these places that they have gone, that they have gone to, shall remain. If that's what Paul's concern was, then obviously it has to be our concern as well. We are to embrace this kind of measures and the concerns for the souls of men and women that we have shared Christ with. There are measures, what measures has to be changed if there's any? What does it affect our, how does it affect our evangelism and our disciple, disciple making? You know, the key is only the disciple can be a disciple builder. If you've never been mentored, never been discipled, how can you be a disciple maker? Correct? It only makes sense that you have to be mentored, you have someone, you have a spiritual father, you have a spiritual mother who birthed you into Christ and he is the one who should be mentoring you. If you don't have a mentor right now, go find yourself one. And if you are not mentoring anyone, it is our responsibility to find one to mentor and train someone else so that you are being duplicated and you are making a disciple by doing that. What I'm trying to say here is the strong helping the weak to be as strong as themselves. Do you get me? I'm strong. I find someone who's weak. I help him to be as strong as I am. I am weak. I find someone who is stronger than myself and ask him to be my mentor and help me out to become a disciple maker. You help me build leaders. We're talking about that. What I'm talking about here is a single shot, surefire pistol. Single shot, but it's surefire. 
It's not a shotgun method, you know, bam, and then you get so many. But these are just converts and not one are leaders, not one are disciple makers. Now, if you have, haven't been discipled yet, like I said earlier, find yourself a mentor, an accountability partner other than your spouse. Find an accountability partner that you will be accountable for and he will be accountable for you and then you will be making each other strong of your, or if he's stronger than you are then he make you strong and lead you and guide you to become a disciple maker he is we should never stop learning and become a disciple builder now the inserts there are and I found it an acronym gems of being a disciple builder if you want to write them down it's this time number one we guide them G we guide them new believers and those who are not so new in Christ but have never actually participated in actually be, being being a disciple in the Word of God needed to be guided accordingly you know we have to guide them these are the ones who will be easily misled and fall out you know after several weeks of attending church and they have not been discipled and mentored properly they fall out so we get them to the right way and the correct path that leads to life through the reading and obedience of the Word of God the psalmist says in uh, Psalm 119 105 it says there your word is a lamp unto my feet and what a light unto my path so we use the word of God we guide this brother or sister in Christ through the word of God so that his way in life is lighter than he is on a correct and direct and straight path so number one guide them number two we encourage them we encourage them when new believers haven't experienced yet the warmth of a true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, they will easily give up. Of course, right? Our task is to encourage them. There are moments that we get tired. We seize that opportunity to motivate them. We see our brother tired, getting slow. We motivate them. We lift them up. When you find your brother becoming tired, people experience a burnout in life not because of hard work or too much responsibility or too much work. It is because of wrong motivation. So if the brother is well motivated and he is encouraged, then he will not experience burnout. The Apostle Paul, as he admonishes his prodigy, Timothy, in his second letter, in chapter 4 and verse 2, he wrote, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. That's 2 Timothy 4, 2. We encourage with great patience and careful instruction instruction thirdly number three we mobilize them we mobilize them there's always a tendency for everything not only people not only persons to lose momentum and then ultimately stop to a standstill I'll give you some lessons in physics those who are engineers here brother Josh and brother uh, George they know a little bit about engineering but um, whoever have heard about Newton's laws of motion? Anyone? Oh, Tita. Yeah. Oh, Rhonda, yeah. The laws of motion of uh, the good Isaac Newton. It's very interesting, and you may have applied it to our lesson. You can apply it to our lesson this morning. First law, when viewed in an internal reference frame, an object either remains at rest or continues to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon by an external force. Say so this, this object is moving 
This object will not stop moving unless it is ex there's an external force that will stop it. Or if an object is at rest, it will never move unless an external force will cause it to move. That's it. Law number one. Law number two, the vector sum of the external forces F on an object is equal to the mass of that object multiplied. Are you still with me? <laughs> multiplied by the acceleration, acceleration vector A of the object. So it's force times mass times force equals mass times acceleration. You know, that means my movement or my acceleration is directly proportionate to the force that is acted on me, multiplied by how heavy or my mass. Okay, that's the second law. Third law, when one body exerts a force on a second body, the second body simultaneously exerts an effort, a force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction on the first body. I'll, I'll tell you what that means. If this object is moving this way, and there's a force acting this way, for us to get an equilibrium, this force has to be equal to the force of this force. You get me? Well, like I said, these laws are applied not <laughs> even to people that we are building relationships with. If we want to build a relationship with someone else, these laws can be applied to. Applying the first law, a person will remain immobile unless acted upon by an external force. Now, the amount of force that you need to exert is directly proportional to the person, person's acceleration or the amount of the reaction that he will in turn do. And that's law number two, right? Also, the third law, this serves to us as a warning that serves always a resistance. There is always a resistance against the work that we are doing. We are trying to evangelize, we are trying to make disciples. There will always be a resistance that is equal in magnitude. The enemy, the devil, will always do his work to resist us equal, if not more, than what we exert. Because he does not want people to be saved. And that's why he's doing his work double time. That's why we have to double time as well in making disciples. Mind you, it is of the same magnitude, like I said earlier, but opposite in direction of our purpose and mission and vision. Our vision is to share. The enemy's mission is to do against what we have, we are doing. Right? That serves as a warning too. But we mobilize, we mobilize them, keep them mobile, and keep that kinetic energy going. You like physics? There's more. You want more? No more. Okay. Number four. <laughs> Number four. We support them. We support them. People have needs. Yeah? That's the last in our uh, mission statement. People have needs. We support them by helping out with their practical needs. It's easier if we did it as a body, you know, as if we did everything as a, as a church. We do it as one, it's easier for us to help, correct? Of course. Look at, for example, how the New Testament church, the early church did. They gathered everything, they sold everything that they had, and no one had need. Every need was met during their time because they did it as a body. They shared what they had, supporting one another, you know, and made work lighter for everyone. Again, let me remind you of the words of our Master, Jesus Christ. I have appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. He wants our fruit to remain. The Great Commission is just not just about converting people to become Christians, to become saved, to become followers of Christ. But for them to be disciples, people who are disciple makers, who are ushering 
people into the presence of God. We must also always have the sense of urgency and concern, just like what Paul had, that we remain faithful and for us to finish strong so that the grace of God is not received in vain. Wag masayang, not received in vain. Our goal therefore for ourselves and for the ones that we have led to Christ is that we attain a spiritual maturity. And that never ends. Every day, you become one day more mature in Christ. Mature enough so that the fruits that we bear will remain. Like a father, we cannot picture a child to be orphaned and stray away from the faith. We don't want that to happen. We don't want our fruit to stray away from the faith. I can't overemphasize the phrase sense of urgency. As true disciples and followers of Christ, we should always have that, the sense of urgency. Life is very fleeting. It's very, it's like a, a fog, a smoke. Here now, gone tomorrow. It's very fragile. As earlier this morning, Bella was telling me what the word fragile is, and here it is. Life is very fragile. I'm sure you have already heard about the very recent events, you know, that happened within my, my family. It's not even a month ago we went to California and attended a simple but very beautiful wedding of two young couples. But the turn of events ruined that joyful experience to a sorrowful one. My nephew-in-law and my niece and four other nieces were involved in a very tragic accident that took the lives of John, my nephew-in-law, and Audrey, my niece, you know, who flew from the Philippines just to attend that wedding. Another niece is still in critical condition, and the one uh, Cynthia was, you know, mentioned earlier. You see, if John and Audrey did not know the Lord, our mourning would have been more than what it is now. But our comfort is the fact, is in the fact that because the Bible says that they are now with the Lord and our faith confirms that. So you see, if your friends who doesn't know Christ yet, if you have friends like that, it's very urgent that they too will know Him who holds the future. Because life is very fragile. They should also know Him who is sovereign over everything. Elsa and myself had the opportunity of rearing two kids to their maturity. You can't just leave them alone once they're born. When you have led someone to Christ, you don't, you don't say, okay, you know that you have Christ, you, you know, you're on your own. You don't do that. You make him a disciple. You guide them, you encourage them, you mobilize them, and you support them. You do that until such time that they're able to do it on your own. That they themselves guide someone else, encourage someone else, mobilize someone else, and support someone else as well. Sometimes you don't let go even if you know that they're already able to, do, to go on their, their own. This illustration is intended to remind us to follow the Great Commission, to make disciples, guide, encourage, mobilize, and support. They are all for Jesus shed His blood and appointed to bear fruit that remains. May the Lord find us faithful in doing the Great Commission and may the kingdom work that we do be not put to waste and not in vain. And may the fruits of KCC as a body, as a church, remain until the coming of the Great King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.